New York Democratic State Committee brings you the following videotape report of parts of a meeting between a group of New York college students and the Democratic candidate for United States Senate, Robert Kennedy. We're here tonight, and there's very little more I can say except to introduce first Mrs. Ethel Kennedy, who's sitting over here. And secondly, the former Attorney General of the United States and candidate for the United States Senate from New York, Robert F. Kennedy. The uh, bright group of students. I've learned, I've learned to say that since I've been a candidate. I thought maybe that you'd have uh, some questions and we could just proceed and I'll... But the things that are not brought out, maybe I just say them in the end. You want to try to do that? Go ahead. Uh, sir, could you tell us why you chose to run, run from New York rather than Massachusetts or Virginia or someplace else? <laughs> My uh, brother was in the Navy, and uh, in, originally in intelligence, and uh, he uh, went to uh, make a speech to a group as to what you do when a bomb falls and the fire breaks out. And uh, so he explained what you do, uh, that you throw sand on fire or you throw water on the fire. And if you throw water on the fire that you're supposed to throw the sand on, it spreads it, so you have to be very careful of what you do. And then. Uh, he said at the end of the speech, after he'd spoken for about 15 minutes, he said, uh, now are there any questions? And uh, somebody put up their hand and said, well, how do you tell one fire from the other? And he said, well, there's a fellow coming next week who'll explain that. <laughs> but I will explain that. <laughs> In the first place, I have a close association and identif identification with the state of New York. I mean, I've lived uh, in the state of New York much longer than I lived any other place. I lived here for the first 20 years of my life. I uh, went away then to college, and I went away to law school, and I went away to work. I've worked the last 13 years in Washington now. So even if I was living in the state of New York for a longer period of time, I'd still be in Washington as I have been. I've, uh, our place of business, we ha had a home here in the state of New York, my family, since I was a year old. We've had a home or an apartment here since that time, and our major place of business for my family has been the state of New York. But even beyond that, which I think is more important, if the election's going to be decided based on my accent or where uh, I also have other associations with, I think that the people are going to vote for my opponent. I think that the election really should be decided on the basis of what can, what of the, my opponent or myself can do more for the state of New York and make the greatest amount of difference for this state and for this country over the period of the next six years. Again, if it's going to be judged on who's lived here in the state of New York longer, than my opponent has, but then maybe you should elect the oldest man in the state of New York. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, uh, I'd like to ask you a question which seems to me very close to the heart of the matter, and if it sounds blunt, uh, so be it. Um, aren't you really using New York State as a kind of jumping off place for your own presidential ambitions? First, let me say, I would like, uh, I have really two choices uh, over the period of the last uh, 10 months. I could have uh, stayed in, uh, I could have retired, and, uh, <laughs> and I, my uh, father has done very well, and I could have lived off him. <laughs> or I could have, uh, continue to work for the government. I mean, that's my major interest, and the major interest of my family. Again, I don't see anything really sinister about that. We've all worked for the United States government. I'd like to continue to work for the United States government. 
Now, I think that to uh, being a United States senator, I mean, seeing that in my own family, I think is an, uh, a position, a very lofty position, and a position where you can accomplish a great deal. We talked, and you asked me about the fact that I want to use this as a jumping off place. I don't know where I can jump off to, uh, as we have a Democratic president. He's going to be elected in 1964. In my judgment, he's going to be reelected. <laughs> He's going to get, uh, be re-elected in 1968, so that the earliest that I'm going to be jumping off someplace <laughs> is 1972, which is eight years from now. I'm going to have to be a wonderful United States Senator from eight years. I'm going to have to get... A... I'm, I'm, going to have, I'm going to have to be re-elected in six years. I'm going to have to run and appear before the people of the state of New York. I'm going to have to have done a good job in the state of New York. I don't see me working and making this kind of effort that New York loses anything by it. I hear somebody else outside said, are you going to serve your whole six years? Well, I don't know where I'd go. <laughs> well, frankly, I don't need the title, because I could be called general, I understand, for the rest of my life. I've been a general. <laughs> And I don't need the money, and I don't need the office space. So I, I, I would just, I mean, frank as it is, and maybe it's difficult to understand in the state of New York, I'd like to just be a good United States Senator. I'd like to serve. Mr. Kennedy, just how extensive is your moral commitment to civil rights in New York State? <laughs> I've been involved in this struggle now for uh, three and a half years. I think I've indicated how I feel about it uh, all over the country and the efforts that I've made. Uh, and I think that, uh, I think that uh, a good deal more can be done elsewhere. In my judgment, the answer as far as the state of New York is concerned now rests with uh, education and it rests with employment and it rests with decent housing and it rests with uh, proper recreation facilities and it rests basically in giving our young people some hope. Now let me just say that, for instance, there's 26 and a half percent of the young Negroes in the city of New York who are out of school and out of work. The uh, Negro child going to many of the schools in Harlem between the third grade and the sixth grade loses 10 points on his IQ. By the time he gets to the eighth grade, he's already two years behind white students. Uh, the dropout rate amongst Negroes in some of these areas where the schooling is not as good as in white areas, the dropout rate sometimes goes up to 75 or 80 percent. I think, therefore, we have to have a major effort in the field of education. The education effort must start for, with children who are three years old and four years old because many of these children come from broken homes. They come from uh, parents who are illiterate. They never hear an intelligent conversation at home. They never have anybody read them, read them a book. So by the time even that they start in the first grade, they are culturally deprived. I think that's what we tried to do in the How You and Act effort here in the city of New York, focusing attention on the fact that these children, even at that young age, need attention and need help. Then if they're bringing homework back at the second or third grade and nobody's there to make them do their homework, you know, I've seen my own children, and if you don't make them do their homework, uh, then they don't do their homework. And if uh, nobody knows how to read in their home, a third to third to a half in of the homes that these children come from are broken homes. And a high percentage of their one parent that stays with them is illiterate. So they're never going to get any homework done. Nobody's going to. So I think we have to set up special efforts to make sure there's places for them to study because the housing is insufficient overcrowded and substandard and I think that we have to have special counselors and I think we have to have make a special effort for for reading to make sure that they continue reading because that's the key uh, and then I think also we have to do more as far as employment we have almost 500,000 people who are unemployed here in the state of New York uh, twice as many percentage wise are, uh, Negroes are unemployed as whites some areas of the state of New York it goes up to three and three and a half times as many I think therefore what we can do as far as bringing new jobs and keeping industry here, here in the state is going to be terribly important. We're going to have to find here in the city of New York alone 650,000 new jobs by 1970. We're going to have to find a million jobs in the state of New York by 1970. 
where they're going to come from. We're going to have employment for those who are educated and those who are trained, but those who are illiterate and uneducated, they're the ones that are going to have difficulty. So that's where I think we have to make the effort. Your views are radically opposed to Senator Keating's on such fields as education and housing. Although Senator Keating voted for the housing bills of 61 and 64, could you please elaborate on other specific issues which the views of uh, yourself and Senator Keating's differ radically? Well, I uh, gave you uh, basically where I disagree. I disagree in those two very important areas. I don't think it's just a question of voting on the final bill. I think it's a question of what you do while you while the bill is coming up and what, you, what kind of amendments you support. I think that's important in education and it's also important in housing. I think these are two of the major pieces of legislation or major areas which affect the people of the state of New York. Third, very important matter, is my whole concept of being a United States Senator. I look over the period of the last three and a half years of the problems that I suppose the basic problems that are facing the state of New York. Housing, education, transportation, hospital construction, those are, well, in the field of education, it wasn't the junior senator from the state of New York who led the fight on that, it was the senator from the state of Oregon. In unemployment, which is another problem, it wasn't the junior senator from the state of New York who led the fight on the floor of the United States Senate, it was the senator from the state of West Virginia, it was the senator from the state of Pennsylvania, and it was the senator from the state of Michigan. In the field of hospital construction, it's a major problem here in the city of New York, in the state of New York. It wasn't the junior senator from the state of New York who led that fight, it was the senator from the state of Alabama. In the, question, in the area of transportation, it wasn't the junior senator from the state of New York who led that fight, it was a senator from the state of New Jersey. I mean, for instance, what is the Keating bill? I mean, now that's the problem. Now, President Kennedy wrote a book uh, ten years ago, Profiles and Courage it was a story of 12 United States Senators. 12 United States Senators who made a contribution. It wasn't just a question of the fact that they voted on measures that were offered by somebody else and they were written about in a book. They did something themselves. They gave some direction. They met, made a difference in their constituency. They made a difference in the United States. I mean, when you think of uh, the great senators from the state of New York, of Robert Wagner, you don't think of, God, he, re he showed up for more roll calls than anybody else. You don't think of Herbert Lehman, uh, he uh, followed the leadership of somebody else. He was the conscience of the United States Senate. That's the kind of leadership. I say that we look at the Department of Justice over the period of the last three and a half years, we passed more legislation dealing, came out of the Department of Justice than any other period in, in history. We passed seven bills dealing with organized crime, the Civil Rights Bill, the efforts for the indigent and the poor and providing counsel for them, as well as many, many other areas. I think this was important. I think this was a direction. This wasn't just going out and making a speech about the matter. We talked about the other day about immigration. Well, we did something. When the Chinese came out of uh, uh, communist China into Hong Kong, we got them over here to the United States. It wasn't just a question of putting out a press release. Anybody can do that. But I just, I ask all of you, even those of you who are opposed to me, if you can name one bill, other, if you can name one bill which holds his name, I talk about the Civil Rights Bill. I suppose nobody's spoken about civil rights more than my opponent. But he didn't have a clue, he didn't have one thing to do with the passage of the civil rights bill. I mean, he spoke for it. I think it's fine that he voted for it. I think a United States senator, however, is more than that. I think it's giving some leadership. And I think particularly for the state of New York, it's giving some direction. It's giving some leadership. It's showing some imagination. I think we have problems to face in this country. I think we have problems to face in this state over the period of the next 10 years. As President Kennedy said, we have the capacity to make this the best generation in the history of mankind or make it the last. And I don't think that we can just afford to stand still or sit. I think that we have to give some direction. And I think that the Senate of the United States is a place where the problems that we're going to work out, the problems that are facing this country internally, the problems that are facing us around the world, the Senate's going to give some leadership. The Senate's going to give some direction. And I don't think the st state of New York should have any other than there's somebody who's going to make that kind of effort. I don't think that we can afford, in the 1960s, any state, anybody in the United States, and just being a follower. That's where I disagree. Your opponent has made many charges opposing your candidacy, and one of those was made recently in Buffalo at the NAACP meeting. 
He accused you of uh, walking out on the civil rights movement by resigning as attorney general during the thick of the fight. Uh, do you have an answer to this accusation? Well, uh, I think it's typical of what we've done in this campaign. Uh, first, uh, went before the NAACP, who were aware of what I've done in the field of civil rights, and uh, put out an advance text that I'd run out in the effort to fight for civil rights. He appeared before the NAACP, and he praised me, said I had been a wonderful attorney general, that we'd fought together on the same side in civil rights, and I had been one of the great attorney generals in the field of civil rights. Then he walked out of there. He was asked by reporters whether he stood by his advance text or, what, or the praise that he'd given of me before the NAACP, and he said, I stand by my advanced text. The result was that all across the state was the statement that you just stated, that I uh, ran out on civil rights. He didn't dare say that to the NAACP, which knew differently. I came the next day and I read both statements to them. But uh, I, I, it's the same thing as far as the, this question of, uh, of the interhandle company. First place, uh, this was the charge that he made against me two weeks ago, that I had dealt with Nazis. First, let me say that he is the one that introduced the legislation for the sale of the company. He urged me to, he urged me to make the settlement. He wrote me letters to make the settlement. <clears throat> While this was going, this is 18 months ago. When the settlement was announced, he spoke on the floor of the United States Senate in favor of the settlement and said it was fine. He also brought up the question of whether any of this money would go to Nazis, and he said none of the money would go to Nazis. He satisfied himself that he'd looked into it and it wouldn't go to Nazis. I was Attorney General 17 of the last 18 months. Never raised this question. He did raise the question, in all honesty, he raised the question maybe too much money was being paid. But if one penny was being paid to Nazis, it was wrong. But never the question about the fact that any of this money was going to Nazi interest. I become a candidate for the United States Senate, and suddenly in the middle of a senatorial campaign, I made a deal with Nazis. <laughs> 18 months later, he was on the Judiciary Committee. I was Attorney General of the United States. If there was anything wrong with it, all he had to do was call me before the Judiciary Committee. But not, not only not that, but he wrote me letters of praise. He spoke to newspapers about how good he thought this was. He was going to bring new jobs to the state of New York. He was 100% in favor of it. I think that first his statement on the, the uh, as far as the NAACP was an attempt to prejudice those who were interested in civil rights against my candidacy. I think as far as the statement on uh, the Nazi deal was an effort to influence the voters of the state of New York, particularly Jewish voters who suffered so much from the Nazi, against my candidacy. I lost um, both my brother and my brother-in-law in the fight against Nazis. I'm not making a deal with Nazis. Let me also say that uh, two days ago, he said that I uh, had uh, sold out on immigration and never done anything on immigration. It was our legislation before the Senate of the United States, which is before his committee, of which he's a member, which dealt with immigration. It was uh, the Department of Justice who made the special arrangement to permit the Chinese to come in here. I was the, uh, we are the first time that came out, per first group, which, and the legislation was drawn up in the Department of Justice, against, came out against the national quota system, which he has not done. I think it's a difficult campaign. <laughs> Many of us have been wondering whether or not you were going to ever issue a concise statement on your position in regards to the McCarthy hearings and the purges of Senator jo Joseph McCarthy. Would you be willing to offer a statement now? I went to work in 1953 for the um, committee that was headed by Senator McCarthy. There was a Democratic counsel for that committee. Mr. Flanagan was kept over from the previous committee uh, headed by the Democrats. He hired me. I went to work for him. I was not involved in any of the communist hearing of Senator McCarthy during that period of time, which I worked for the committee. I worked for the committee for approximately six months. I disagreed with what was happening on the committee, which I did not have any personal involvement, but other things that they were doing. I was a member of the staff. I reached the conclusion that I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I went to Senator McCarthy, and I said that I disagreed with what they were doing, and I wasn't going to stay with the committee any longer. And I left in June of 1953. I went then for the, with the Hoover Commission. The Democratic members also walked off the committee. I left the committee. I went to the Hoover Commission. In February of 1954, the Democrats came back on the committee. They had enough confidence in me that they hired me as their counsel. 
to represent them. I went through the Army McCarthy hearing as the counsel for the Democrats, with the counsel Senator McClellan, Senator Symington, Senator Jackson. I was the one that wrote the report on Senator McCarthy in the Army McCarthy hearings. I wrote that report, and which was signed by the Democratic members and, and uh, was written by me. And uh, so that's my record. I, I believe at a rather young age, I stood up on the question of principle. Uh, since you haven't lived in New York State recently, do you feel that, that you understand the state's problems today? Well, I think I do. As I said earlier, I think that the fact that I've been involved in all of these matters. I mean, I've, the, the effort that was made in Harlem dealing with young people were set up by me as chairman of the Committee on Juvenile Delinquency. Uh, the Har You and Act. Those, those efforts were made, the effort that was made up in the city of Syracuse set up by me as chairman of the Committee on Juvenile Delinquency. The great problem, I would think, in the state of New York now is to make sure that people of different races and colors can live together. There's been nobody that's been more in the center of that than I have uh, over the period of the last three and a half years. Or the question of employment, the question of housing, that, uh, that effort, and the question of education, those efforts were all, I was intimately involved in all of those efforts over the period of the last three and a half years in the administration. They had an effect in the state of New York, bringing new industry into the state of New York, bringing new industry, making sure there are enough jobs. That came about through the tax cut and the uh, depreciation uh, allowance that we put through in 1963. All of these matters were matters in which I was intimately involved in. I was directly involved in. I was involved in the consultation and the drawing up of the legislation. And as I say, even beyond that, it's a question of survival. And I've been involved in that. So I think I understand the problem. The state of New York, I've been all over this state now, and everybody's, I've had a lot of press conferences, and a lot of questions have been asked of me. If anybody can ask me a question about any matter that involves the state of New York, and find out whether I know what I'm talking about. That's the easiest way. I've opened myself to all of you. If I don't know the problems of the state of New York, then it should be demonstrated by asking me a question to find out if my answer makes any sense. Sir, you mentioned the question of housing, and on this specific issue, it's well known that the problems of New York City are perhaps larger than any other area. What specifically would you do, which hasn't been done before, to bring better housing programs to the city of New York and to the entire state of New York? Well, uh, first, there are a million people, as you point out, there are a million people who are living in substandard and overcrowded housing in the city of New York, or another million outside the city of New York. Actually, as much or more is bun done about housing in the city of New York as any other city comparable or, or any lo other large city in the United States. The problem is that New York's bigger than any other city. So the result is there are greater problems here than any other place. As far as public housing is concerned, I'd extend that program and expand it. I'd also expand the program for middle uh, income housing. I'd also uh, make an effort uh, for urban renewal in a different with different emphasis than there is at the present time. I try to rehabilitate uh, some of the establishments that are now in existence rather than just knocking them down. I'd also make more of an effort uh, to uh, take care of those who are moved out in a urban renewal program. They get moved out of one area, there's a more expensive project that's placed in that area, they can't afford the rent, what happens to them? They go back into another slum, so we're not really dealing with the slum problems. So I would uh, make more of a, I would have more of an emphasis on that. I'd also put greater emphasis on providing housing for people over the age of 65. We have more people over the age of 65 living in this state than any other state of the union, almost two million. A million of them live under poverty conditions. Widows in the state of New York, on the average, live on an income of $880 a year. Well, you can't get by with that. There are twice as many people over the age of 65 percentage-wise, who are living in overcrowded and substandard housing than those under the age of 65. So I'd make a special effort to help them. Let me just say, I run for the uh, United States Senate because I think it's such an important position, because I want to play a role. And uh, I saw over the period of the last three and a half years, and I say this to you, some of you who support my candidacy and some who do not, more in a nonpartisan way, and I saw in the last three and a half years really what a difference an individual can make. And I, uh, if I saw 
anything or learned anything, it was really that. And I think particularly those who are educated and those of you such as yourselves, those of you who are, took the effort to come here tonight are interested in politics, are interested in government. I think to continue that interest after you leave college is absolutely essential if we're going to have success in this country and success in the state and success in the world. And I saw it, whether it be in the Peace Corps, I saw it with people that headed up agencies and departments. The fact that they showed some initiative or showed some imagination or uh, were, able, were willing to, to go out into areas that had never been attacked before. That's what made the difference in the government over the period in the last three and a half years. It's not that we made the problems disappear, but it was that kind of an effort. And uh, I think that that's what we need uh, in the United States over the period of the next 10 years. As President Kennedy said, we have the capacity to make this the best generation in the history of mankind or make it the last. I think that we ha can make it the best generation. But I think really it's going to rest with those who are educated, those people who are trained, whether they are going to participate or whether they're going to say this is some the problem or responsibility of somebody else. That's why I think that all of you have had the advantage of an education here, just as I've had the advantage of an education, that we have a special and particular responsibility. When we look and analyze where our government came from, or our system of government, where it originated, we think back to the Greeks and what their idea really was of participation. And what Pericles said in his funeral oration, that we differ from other states and that we regard the individual who holds himself aloof from public affairs as being useless. And yet we yield to no one in our independence of spirit and complete self-reliance. I think that's what has to guide us. And the Greeks, uh, the word idiot coming from that individual who didn't participate, who wasn't actively involved. President Kennedy's favorite quote was really from Dante, that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in time of moral crisis preserve their neutrality. So if all of us, whether it's in the field of civil rights or housing or whether it's in Vietnam or whatever it is, just hang back and say this is the problem of somebody else. If we're going to permit what's going on in Harlem now, of those their young children grow up uneducated and untrained, and dissatisfied with life and dissatisfied with their future and feeling that there is nothing in this system, then uh, we're going to be in difficulty. Even if we look at this selfishly, we're going to be in difficulty. The whole system's going to be in difficulty. Uh, Sophocles said uh, one time, well, what joy is there in, in the day that follows day, some swift, some slow, with death the only goal. And really that's what many of our fellow citizens, whether they're in Appalachia or whether they're in Harlem, or whether they are the white children that live in some of these other areas where there's no future, or even our elderly people over the age of 65 who feel that there's not any future for them, that all they're going to do is die and get sick and go have to take a pauper's oath. These, I think, are our responsibilities. These are your responsibilities, just as they are mine. Now, I hope that I win as a United States Senator, but even if I don't, I think that for all of us, that we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. If we don't do it, then nobody's going to do it. And if educated people don't do it, then nobody's going to do it. And the people that are going to make the difference for this country and for the world are educated people. And we have a special, not only responsibility, but a special opportunity to make a difference in the world and make a difference for this country. And that's really uh, what I come to say to you. I think of uh, what uh, Archimedes said, and perhaps it's a little <laughs> explaining the lever. And he said, uh, show me where I can stand and I can move the world. And I think that we can. I think that we started it three and a half years ago, and I think we can continue it. And uh, I don't think it's just a question of political belief, but I think that we can make a difference. And so, thank you. Let's put Robert Kennedy to work for New York. On November 3rd, vote for the Johnson-Humphrey Kennedy team.